and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in heaven will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect four from the winds, from the ends of earth to the ends of heaven. Well, believe it or not, way back when I was on that pro wrestling circuit in the late 90s, I needed another job to pay the bills. I was a roofer. I put new shingles on houses with about the most ragtag crew that you can imagine. And even though the winters in Ohio, where I lived at the time, they weren't what we typically get around here, they still got plenty cold and snowy. But the bills, even in the winter, still needed to be paid. And the houses still needed shingling. So we worked year-round. I remember when we didn't, because there was an ice storm, speaking of laundry of love, The laundry still had to be done, but there was no money coming in. How many of you have looked through the cushions of your couch for laundry money? Yep, some of us have. I remember doing that back then. (laughs) Well, as I mentioned, this crew, this roofing crew that I worked with was rough around the edges, you could say. And I had nicknames for all of them back then. I'll give you one name, and you can figure out the rest. Barbituate Brad. You can guess why. Well, the rest of the crew, they, had, they were of similar states, if you know what I mean. Not exactly the frame of mind you want going up on an icy or snow-covered roof, but someone had to go up on the roof to drop those air hoses that we'd be using for the air, air nailers. Someone had to bring them up there. Someone had to carry all those hoses up on their shoulder, climb on the roof, no matter the amount of snow or ice, get to the peak and drop the hose down to the compressors below. First thing upon arrival. Guess who drew that straw? Yep, the clear-headed kid from the Midwest. I think they called me Opie in the beginning. It wasn't all bad news, though. I learned to have my hammer in hand on those treacherous climbs up the roof. You see, you kept that hammer in your hand, claw end forward, in case you slipped on the roof. Remember, you're climbing on wintry roofs, on just sheeting. The idea being that if you started to slide down that roof, before you went over the edge, hopefully, you would thrust that claw into your hammer into the roof and hang on. That was the plan. And it worked, most of the time. And those were some cold, dark days. And dark days are how our scripture passages begin today. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in heavens will be shaken. Yikes. I seem to have drawn a tough section of scripture, Marty. Sun darkened. No moonlight, stars falling, heavenly power shaken. Is Jesus describing winter in North Dakota? In this chapter of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is foretelling the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. So, what does Jesus' message mean? And what bearing does it have on our lives today. And what does this have to do with me on a roof? 
in those days. Let me go back here. In those days, that tribulation, after that tribulation, the days Jesus is describing here are the events just described in chapter 13 of Mark. That tribulation. And this business with the sun, moon, and the stars that will take place at the end of the future tribulation period. And the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in heavens will be shaken. Well, this certainly isn't a Disney vacation Jesus is describing, is it? The sun goes black, the stars will be falling, the power is shaken, as the formerly Christ-controlled universe is suddenly allowed to become random and chaotic. This future tribulation. Who wants to ride that roller coaster? This event that Jesus is describing doesn't sound like anything I care to experience without some insurance. Just as I didn't care to careen off an icy roof in my days as a shingle layer. But it did happen on occasion. This type of language that Jesus uses about the end of the universe and events such as war and exile and famine is like the Old Testament prophets used. Jesus is originally using this language likely to describe the consequences of a war with Rome. And the temple that the, disciple, that the disciples were admiring at the time would indeed be violently destroyed less than 40 years later from this event. You've probably heard this saying, your body is a temple. Have you heard that before? Well, let's pretend for a moment that we are the temple that they're talking about here. The temple Jesus' disciples are admiring in Jerusalem. The temple Jesus says will be destroyed. Sun and moon go dark. Stars fall from heaven. Power shaken. You know, it may not be too difficult to compare the temple to us because... All of that stuff sounds a lot like aging, doesn't it? Even if you disagree with that, it's likely you can see that going dark, stars falling, and power shaken, well, that can really describe life at times. Am I right? And when I make that comparison, suddenly the reason for these passages starts to become clear. It's somewhat easy to understand the original reasons for Jesus saying all this when you consider the pending destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. That would certainly affect the original hearers of Jesus' message. But what about us today? Why is there a record of these sayings for all time? The destruction of the temple in AD 70 doesn't exactly have a direct bearing on us here today in 2023. Why then has this from Jesus been recorded for us in all times? What is the significance of these passages in the larger scheme of things? The longer we all go along in life, the easier it is to see the significance of darkened sun and moon, the falling of stars and heavenly power shaken, because life is hard. And you could live the most charmed and blessed life in history, and you will still see how dark and hard life can be even if only in the lives of others. Man, that is hard. And just thinking about that, the hardness of life can bring darkness of its own. Like a long winter that seems to drain you from enjoying the stars in the sky, and your own power gets shaken 
from the trials and tribulations of life. Is the end of the world coming soon? Some people seem to think so. Certainly, there's plenty of news in the world to lend credibility to that. Truth is, we don't know. And according to Scripture, not even Jesus knows when. Why, then, this apocalyptic, scary message? Because that isn't the end. This whole chapter of Mark deals with the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem and the end of the world. And then this verse. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Hope. Just like that candle, it hopes it keeps burning. <laughs> Hope. As Advent season begins, we lit the candle of hope. What does a candle do? What's its purpose? Yeah. At its core, the purpose of a candle is bringing light to a darkened space. And just as these passages start out dark, that isn't the end. The hope shown in this verse brings light. And that light is Jesus. The significance of these passages for us is that in life we will face darkness. Especially if we're around when the great tribulation happens. But that isn't the end. God has given us the way out. Our hope in darkness. Our hope in life. And our hope in death is Jesus. Darkness comes, but so does hope. So does Jesus. So how does that affect your understanding of God? If Jesus is our hope, how does that affect your understanding of God? For me, God is saying that this world and those in it will go through growing pains. And growing pains, they come in many ways. But this also said that God has provided us a way through it. God has provided light where there is darkness. God has provided shelter from those falling stars. And God has provided strength when the powers are shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. This tells us that despite the difficulties that we all face, God has provided the way because God loves you. If that is how these passages reflect our understanding of God, what do they say about our conduct? What are we to do? You know, sometimes I just want to be told bluntly and directly what to do. Anyone else like that? Just tell me what to do. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. We have a choice to make. God's word has told us the choices, even the results. 
We've covered the darkness and what awaits there. We know about that. And you can certainly choose the darkness. And some do. Or you can choose the light. When the time comes, whenever that is, God's elect will be gathered up in the light. And that is our choice. The elect is those that choose to follow Jesus. Those that choose to follow Jesus. Elect to follow the way, the truth, and the light. Just as the claw of my hammer provided me hope on a snowy roof that worked most of the time, Jesus is the guarantee. Jesus is our hope, now and forever. Let's pray. God, when things seem bad in this world, remind us to pray for peace. Remind us, no matter the circumstances, that our hope is in Jesus. God, we thank you for your grace in our lives, and we thank you for your son, Jesus. Amen.